Hello, today is Monday, April 6, 2015, and I am your host, Sue Brown, and welcome to Info to Rail, your freight train to modern media. How y'all doing today? Welcome to our show, and we have a great show in store for you. We're, all for we're very fortunate to have Professor Emeritus at Montana State University, Artie Sixkiller Clark, with us today. First, we're going to take a little glimpse into the news. According to MUFON.com News, a Virginia witness at Stratton reported watching three glowing lights in a triangle formation just 100 yards overhead, according to testimony in case 64239 from the Mutual UFO Network witness, witness reporting database. The witness stepped outside about 5 a.m. on February 28, 2015 for a cigarette when three red lights came into view in the sky. While they looked solid, they appeared as if looking through a stained glass window. Blurry almost, the witness stated. The lights were in triangle formation, moving south at a fast pace. The witness realized that the objects made no sound. The object was moving fast enough that I was sure I would hear a noise typical of any known aircraft, but no noise came. The witness could not make out a body to the craft either. That is fascinating. Absolutely fascinating. Um, we're going to take a break right now, and when we return, we will have Dr. Artie Sixkiller Clark with us. Stay tuned. Don't go away. We'll be right back. All right, we are back. And we have Dr. Artie Sixkiller Clark with us. She brings to the field of UFOlogy degrees in history, English, psychology, and educational leadership, and a background as a teacher, university professor, junior college and university administrator, licensed therapist, and psychologist, and social science researcher. As a professor emeritus at Montana State University and former director of the, of the Center for Bilingual Multicultural Education, Dr. Clark, who is Cherokee Choctaw, has worked with indigenous people for most of her career. Her first book in the field of ufology was the bestseller Encounter, Encounters with Star People, Untold Stories of American Indians. She is also the author of 12 children's books and the best-selling academic text, Sisters in the Blood, The Education of Women in Native America. Hey, hello, Artie, and welcome to the show, and thank you for being with us today. Well, I'm just happy to be here, and, and uh, I'm glad to uh, uh, be a part of your show, and, and hello to all your listeners. Um, can you start out by telling us a little bit about you and what got you interested in the study of indigenous people? Well, you know, I, my career has, has uh, um, I would say more than half of my career has involved work with, with indigenous people. Um, you know, my heritage is uh, um, both Choctaw and, and Cherokee with us. A sprinkling of French and German and I don't know what else uh, uh, is in there but uh, um, you know I grew up hearing star stories uh, and um, when um, I was I, I came to Montana State um, as a director of the Center for Bilingual Multicultural Education and an assistant professor over 35 years ago <laughs> and um, I um, uh, basically have put aside those star stories as stories of my childhood and didn't give them much thought. And uh, uh, one of my jobs as a director of the Center for Bilingual uh, Multicultural Education um, in, in the early years was to go out and to recruit uh, Native American students from 26 tribal groups that we that we served uh, in the Northern Plains. Um, to become teachers, principals, and superintendents because at the time I came here um, to Montana, there were hardly any native teachers or principals or superintendents on the reservations. And um, Montana State University set a goal of changing that. They wanted to see more native teachers and, and leaders in the schools on the reservations. So on my first trip out uh, to recruit students, 
um, this man who was uh, uh, named by the tribe to assist me in, in setting up the meeting and everything. After we had met with a, a, a number of students from that reservation, he said to me, he said, uh, uh, let's go to dinner. And, and we went to dinner in, a, in an off-reservation town. And and then on our way back through the reservation, he said to me, he said, if you got a few minutes, I want to show you something. And I said, sure. And so we went up into the mountains, and he parked the car on the top of this mountain. And he said, come with me. He said, I want to show you something. He said, if we're lucky they'll come. And I said, well, who will come? And he said, well, the, the ancestors, the star people. And so he sat on this big boulder for, I don't know, two or three hours probably. And during that time, he was telling me the stories of his people about the star, star people. And we didn't see anything that night, but on the way back home to Montana State, I kept thinking how many other tribes have similar stories. And here was, you know, I had heard those stories. He was telling me stories. And so when I would go out into the um, to the different reservations and meet with people, if I were in a, in a position uh, informally, you know, after work or on the weekends when I was visiting with people or out to dinner or some kind of a, you know, maybe I'd be going to a high school basketball game or going to a powwow. Anyway, I would ask people, you know, do you have any star stories from your tribe? And so I began collecting those ancient stories, and that led to collecting contemporary stories. And, of course, you know, in the beginning, it was just my own personal interest, my own love of, of uh, stories about people from the stars. And um, it grew into, you know, recording all these contemporary stories about uh, interactions uh, with uh, indigenous people. And, and of course, you know, as, as I progressed in my career, I was speaking at international and national conferences uh, literally all over the world uh, because MSU was, at that, we were at the forefront of, of uh, bilingual multicultural education for Native uh, uh, students, you know, one of the things that, uh, <clears throat> that a lot of uh, people don't know is that so many of the, of the uh, indigenous tribes, the native tribes up here in the Northern Plains, uh, a lot of the people still speak their native language. And so we were, we were encouraging those people who did speak their native language to become uh, teachers. Uh, so that they could work with children who came from bilingual or, or native-speaking homes. And um, uh, today there's less people because as years pass, people don't pass the language on and English has become more dominant, but there's still probably 25% of the people who still speak the native language fluently on, on uh, many of the reservations and in some more than others. Um, but um, that's how I got interested in collecting those stories, and it has just been a journey of love uh, for me and interest in, in uh, you know, uh, hearing those stories, recording those stories. And I really hadn't planned on this second career. When I, when I retired at MSU, I thought, well, I'm going to travel, I'm going to garden, I'm going to spend time at my cabin. I'm going to, you know, do all these things that uh, a lady of leisure so to speak, would do. <laughs> and I was only retired about six months from MSU when I, I got a call uh, asking me if I would be interested in conducting um, an external evaluation for a tribe that had received a $5 million grant from the federal government. And um, so I went back to D.C. to explore it and, and uh, participated in the training exercises of what they expected an evaluator to do. And then I went to the reservation <coughs> to basically scope out the situation, you know. And um, uh, I had lunch with a, a group of women one day, and uh, actually on my final day there, and, and uh, uh, these women said... Uh, 
somehow the topic of UFOs came up, and this one lady said to me, and I, I began telling them some of the stories I collected, and, and uh, this one lady said to me, what are you going to do with those stories? And I said, well, I, I haven't planned to do anything with them. They were just my own interest. And she looked at me and she said, you know, that's part of our oral history. You have a responsibility to do something with them. What's going to happen to them, she said, when you, when you pass? And I said, well, uh, they'll probably just be destroyed. No one probably has the interest that I have. And she said, oh, you have to write a book. Well, little did she know that her words were were uh, kind of fatalistic because on my way back home, it was about a you know twelve hour drive, and I thought, am I going to write a book or am I going to do this evaluation? And I thought, you know, you spent all these years in you know doing studies and and all these kinds of things. Um, you achieved, you know, your goal of being a full professor, now a professor emeritus. Why would you want to go back into that world? <laughs> and so I decided to write a book. And uh, I sat down that next week and started going through. I had almost a thousand stories I had collected. Wow. And just trying to determine which ones. And, and my goal was... For the reader, I wanted them to, to be able to see that what was going on in mainstream society, that there were animal mutilations, there were abductions, there were encounters with different kinds of aliens, that what was happening in mainstream society actually was mirror, mirrored in Native American society. And so... That's the basis for my choosing the stories that I that I selected uh, for encounters with star people. Can you tell and her? Then of course, when I went to Mexico and to Belize and Guatemala and Honduras for the sky people, that was definitely uh, originally I had planned to collect star stories. But you know, going to that part of the world was a was a result of a teenage vow I had made back when I was 15 or 16 years old because I had uh, been given these books by a, a teacher um, that uh, were written by John L. Stevens and Frederick Catherwood was the illustrator, but these were two 19th century explorers who, who went down to that part of the world in Central America, Mesoamerica. Uh, to discover if the rumors they had heard about these ancient cities in the jungle were actually a reality because uh, at the time they left, which was in 1839, all of their colleagues just scoffed at them, said, you know, you're just going on a wild goose chase. They just laughed at them. And Stevens and Catherwood persisted and they, they, they went to that part of the world in search of these ancient cities. Well, after I read these books, you know, like teenagers, you know, I just said, I am going to follow in their footsteps one day. And, of course, you know, that got put on the burner as I tried to earn a living and go to school and pay my tuition and and get advanced degrees. And, and, um, and here I am retired, and I've never done this before. I've never realized this dream and so I decided to do that and that resulted in the sky people I followed Stevens and Catherwood's footsteps along the way I was interested in collecting the ancient stories of the Maya people and the Zapotec and uh, uh, the Mixtec and, and uh, mostly the Maya uh, because those are the ones that Stevens came into contact with and um, uh, not only was I interested in the ancient stories, but I was also interested in the contemporary stories. And one of the things I think that makes that book so unusual is I was interviewing uh, people who, for most part, they were not 
Well, I would say almost 100% they were not influenced by television. You know, if you turn on TV here today, if you get satellite, I don't know about other things, but I live in a part of the world where you can't get cable, so I have to have satellite. But, I, you know, the History Channel, the Discovery Channel, the Nat Geo channels, all of those channels have stuff about aliens and UFOs and Area 51 and, yep. and ancient astronauts. But when you get down to Belize and Guatemala and Honduras and Mexico, they don't have those kind of programs. And the Maya live in these small villages, that mostly in the Yucatan in Mexico, for example. And many of those villages, um, or not many of them, but some of them, don't even have electricity. Wow. They don't have running water. They don't have bathrooms. They don't have the modern conveniences that we take for granted. But what they do have is they watch the stars. They don't spend their time on computers. Now, a lot of them do have cell phones, but it's interesting who they contact. They're just calling each other. Uh, well, pretty much that's what we do, I guess. But you know, just keeping track of family. Uh, children don't have cell phones, just the adults. Um, Wouldn't that be they nice? They in a world that is removed from the hype about UFOs that we have in this country. And yet their stories are remarkably similar to the stories you hear. And so what it makes you think, you know, here's a group of people who do not have that influence from the media. And yet they're telling the same stories. So, by golly, there has to be something to it. Well, can you tell our listeners uh, what's different, be, what the difference is between sky people and star people? There really isn't any difference, I, I think, you know. Um, the sky gods, you know, are basically what they refer to as sky gods, are, are kind of heavenly beings that are... Um, uh, and and you, you hear about them in their ancient lore. But the sky people are basically the same as star people. But in that part of the world, they're mostly referred to as sky people instead of star people. So what are sky people? I mean, what makes them different than, than we are? Because they come from the stars. Um, they are aliens. Oh, what's the char what are their characteristics of these sky people? Well, you know, it differs because, you know, I, I talked with, with people who told me stories of, of uh, insect-looking people. Uh, I talked with people who told me about these giant lizard-like creatures. I talked to people who told me about um, uh, what you would call the perhaps the tall whites in mainstream literature. Um, the I talked to people who said, well, they look like us. They wow. look like the Maya. And, uh, and then I talked to some who, who described what we call the grays. So, so they were just as varied as the stories we hear in our own culture. Hmm. Huh. I know you've been adopted and given traditional names by three northern plain tribes. Can you tell us a little well, bit actually, about my that? My family's within those tribes, yeah. Can you tell us what your traditional names were? Well, the Northern Cheyenne called me Waxhaw Woman. I was given that name by Austin Tumans, who has now passed, but Austin's, Austin was a, uh, a spiritual man on the reservation and, and, uh, um, his prediction was that I would, I would be a person who would work with all tribes and and get along and walk among all people and get along, and and um, at that time that was an important part of my role as the Center for Bilingual Education was to to walk among all tribes um, on um, um, uh, the Cheyenne River Reservation, uh, the Lakota Sioux family gave me the name of um, 
meaning a woman who helps people. Um, and basically, I was a, a, a director of bilingual education in uh, the Rapid City School District and set about helping the children of different language groups. And in the Black Seed, among the Black Seed, a family adopted me there. And her old person, the chief of the tribe, gave me the name of knowledgeable woman or woman with great knowledge. Um, and and uh, um, because of the work I was doing there with the tribal college. So, and, and uh, one of the things that you got to remember is a tribe does not, does not adopt you. Family, families within the tribe adopt you. Wow, that's fascinating. Um, I've read a little bit about sky people, and I've read that mm -hmm. um, the energy consciousness level affects the DNA and the RNA genetic codes of these people. Um, can you tell us anything about that? Well, I really can't. You know, I mean, I'm not familiar with what you might be reading, but all I do know is that I have interviewed people who have told me that the reason why they were taken according to the aliens who took them is because their DNA was closest to theirs. And at the time they were taken, which is most fascinating, is that there wasn't even the term DNA used in the uh, American language or English language. It was uh, uh, back in the in the 60s and early 70s when when these individuals were were uh, uh, abducted. And and in fact, this one lady kept a journal. And it was really interesting because she said, "Take a look at this." And 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 the year of her journal was 1973. And and here was this this these initials DNA. And she said, the aliens told her, you won't know what this means for another 20, 25 years, but your DNA is like ours. Wow. And uh, and that's the reason why we, we take your blood and we study you. So I thought that was rather interesting. I always wondered, you know, there's so many people abducted that come forward and say that they're abducted. And I, I, I always wondered you know, what their reasoning for taking us and, and studying us was, you know? It... Well, I've heard varied stories from people who have communicated with aliens. Some people say that that uh, uh, they have been told that uh, um, they are, humans are being abducted uh, because um, uh, they hope well, for example, one one individual told me that on this one one planet um, that um, the people started uh, replacing their humanity with uh, mechanical technology uh, kinds of things, and so they lost their humanity. And they became more like machines than than uh, uh, and lost those humanistic characteristics. And as a result, they're hoping to get that back into their uh, uh, breeding program, and so that they take the DNA and different things from the humans, hoping that they can recreate that. Um, others have told me that. Uh, a lot of the people who are abducted go willfully um, and uh, that they choose to be and that results in part of the missing um, uh, the missing people on the planet that are never found or they can't explain away why they're missing they didn't run away they weren't murdered they weren't they didn't meet foul play it's just that it, some people decide to to go with them and do not uh, and and this individual who is telling me about this said that the people uh, the aliens are very careful who they take and they want to make sure that uh, the individuals have no ties on earth or have given up on their life here and that they willfully want to go with them um, so there's that component too I often wondered if, because 
the American race is so evil. Um, I'm not really sure what the temperament. I don't think it's just the American race. I think it's human. Or the human, human race. race. Sorry, that's what it's I meant. Violent, you know? But I wondered often if you know to when they extract like sperm and ovum and stuff. I wondered if they sometimes wondered if they were trying to replace the you know the human race with. It, uh, with less violent sorts, you know, that's what I wondered if they were trying to, you know, kind of make a breed that was human like without the violence. Well, I don't know, you know, I can't speak to that because I've never heard that theory, but you know, everything is a possibility, I think, when it comes to, uh, um, you know, the, the study, uh, you know, everything is. Is so secretive from our government, and and scientists don't dare, you know, even look into this for fear that they will be ostracized or lose their jobs. Um, I have a friend that worked in NASA back many years ago during the moon landing periods, and he tell, told me that, you know, if you go into the lounge, you know, astronauts are sitting around talking about aliens, Scientists are sitting around talking about them, but it doesn't go outside that room because they don't dare say anything for fear of, of losing uh, their jobs, their pensions, you know, basically ridiculed for the rest of their lives for giving up any kind of secret that NASA may hold. Do you think, um, do you think in the near future that uh, the secrets... And the exposure of aliens and, and all the truth of it is going to come out for all of us to know? I think that it's going to. I don't think that with the Internet and with, the, you know, the knowledge that uh, uh, people have today and their ability to root out the truth, I think that it's probably going to happen, yes. More and more you're, you're hearing legitimate scientists, uh, you know, uh, come out and addressing the issue. And, you know, uh, Stephen Hawking just, you know, not too long ago came out and said, you know, we better be careful what we're doing out there. He said, you know, searching out for other civilizations, what we need to do is be quiet because it may be that the people out there are going to want Earth. The same as, as um, the people who wanted to take America away from the native people. Uh, the people from the stars may want to take the planet away from everybody. And so he said, you know, he thinks it's quite dangerous what we're doing. And, I, you know, I really found that interesting because the same friend from NASA who was telling me about the astronauts and the scientists also told me that uh, his biggest fear is that the aliens are not friendly, that they have their eye he says he doesn't believe that aliens are out there looking out for the for for us as humans, and that they're going to save us if some great catastrophe happens, because he says that the what they're looking out for he believes is the planet Earth. He said this planet is a gem in this solar system. Hmm. It's the only one that sustains life, and he said, I'm sure they would love to have it. And he says, I think that we, instead of thinking they're going to save us, that we ought to realize that they're only interested in the planet. We are low down on their priority list. I've wondered that often myself. Um, yeah, well, that's what he said. Do you believe that we have alien beings walking amongst us all the time? Well, if I believe what the Maya tell me, and I believe so, what some of my other contacts tell me, yes. So they look just I've like people. I've been told that they have the ability to change into any form that they want to change into. And that when they're on this planet, they walk around as human beings. Hmm. When they're on another planet, they walk around as whatever um, dominant species there is. Um, so, you know, yes, I do believe they walk among them. I wonder that. I'm very uh, intuitive when it comes to this stuff. I've been into ufology for a long time. Um, I've been into the paranormal my whole life. I have paranormal things happen to me all the time. 
but this is something I've been very interested in since a little since I was a little kid. Um, I guess my big one of my biggest questions is why these aliens only show themselves to certain people, and why other you know why not other people? Well, I think part of it comes from the fact that that um, um, the majority of humans, I think, have lost their ability to see. Um, I had a, 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 a lack of known Indian in uh, Palenque tell me that um, we have this invisible eye that allows us to see the things that are not on the surface, but that over time people have lost that ability to use that third eye. And as a result, they no longer see what's really around them. And he said, if they could see, they would know that aliens are here. I believe that. But because they can't see, they don't know it. And, and he said, they are invisible unless you have that ability. But we just lost it because we no longer cared about it. And um, so that may be true. In my he studies. I believed it. Well, in my studies, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Well, I, you're you're fading in and out a little bit, and uh, uh, so I, I didn't understand what you asked me. Um, in my studies through uh, paranormal and such, I've learned throughout the years that, um, like little kids, when they tell you that there's something in their under their bed, or you know, they uh -huh. have when they have a, like imaginary friends and such. I've come to believe right. that these kids really do, they do see things. They do have a friend that's not imaginary. And I think us as parents, we shut that down in our kids quickly. You know, we tell our kids, there's nobody there. You don't really see that person that you think you're talking to. They're not really there. And I think as parents, we close the door on our kids to actually... I think you're right. I've, I've noticed that in my studies because when I was a kid... You know, what I saw and what I heard were really there, and my parents never, never told me that they weren't there. They just said, well, if they're bothering you, tell them to leave you alone. Sure. So I still can see well, the think, spiritual. you're right, Sue. I think that's, that's, uh, that we're born with that gift and that ability to see, but that, that uh, if it's not nurtured uh, and encouraged, that we lose it. Absolutely. And that's basically what he was saying to me. I have a thing with deja vu, um, and I'm not sure why, but anytime I have a deja vu moment or anything else, it's my deja vu is a warning. Um, I've had this since I was little. And when I get into a particular time when something is happening and I've been there before and my mind automatically races to the end of the situation and it's usually a bad outcome and my first intuition is that I have to change this by stopping the events that are happening in this order right now to stop some sort of a um, bad detrimental outcome and I've had this my whole life and I've always it's always worked for me um, like if for instance, if my daughter wants to go somewhere, and I've been in that moment before, even though she's never asked me to go to this place, um, all of a sudden, I've been there before, and I race to the end, and there's a car accident that would have happened, or, you know, one of the parents would have been gotten sick, and she would have had to come home, or something always negative is at the end of it. So I always rush to change the outcome, and it's always worked for me that way. You know, um, I'm familiar with that. Uh, kind of, I, 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 I never heard it referred to as deja vu, but but that ability to um, to predict um, things of the future um, and to literally see forward and see what's going to happen at an event and whether it's going to be successful or not. Um, so, um, yeah, I, I know what you're talking about. Sometimes I mean, it's scary. I had it in my <laughs> own family, so I know that those things do exist. 
I've been a psychic most of my life. I, I've read tarot cards for a lot of years of my life and stuff. But that's one of the biggest gifts I have is to be able to intervene in a bad situation and change the outcome by seeing to the end of it and seeing exactly where I can change it so that the outcome is not bad. I don't know if it's well, a gift. it's certainly a gift. I can tell you that, Sue. It's, it's different. Sometimes it's pretty scary. But, um, well, what you have to do is learn how to, how to channel it so that, that it's positive rather than negative, you know. Have you ever witnessed yourself? I, I um, remember. Go ahead. Have you ever witnessed yourself any aliens? Yes. But I really don't like to talk about it publicly because I feel that I need to focus on the people that that told me their stories rather on my, than on myself. Okay. I was just wondering. Um, I read in your Sky... Yes, I have. In your book, Sky People, you tell of your amazing seven-year ad adventure collecting stories of all these encounters. Right. Um, can you share some of those amazing... some more of those amazing stories with us? I'd be happy to. You know, uh, uh, it, it's hard for me... Um, to choose a favorite, um, I um, I tried to to uh, give the readers a variety of stories. Um, one of, one of the ones I found most interesting was uh, uh, a, a story uh, that I call an alien uh, hitchhiker. I uh, I met the. Uh, these three brothers at an outdoor cafe. It had been a, a meeting that had been arranged by by my driver. Um, they were. Um, they told me the story about being at their sister's wedding, and after the wedding reception was over, they were charged with packing up all the folding chairs and the tables because their his sister had apparently. I borrowed them from some group that needed them the next day, probably a church or something. But anyway, they had this van, and they were loading these uh, uh, um, tables and chairs into the back of this van. And this man approached them and asked them for a ride. And they said that, you know, they turned around and looked, and, you know, he was dressed, you know, typically like they were, and he was wearing a cowboy hat, and it was dark, and they really didn't see see his face, but they figured he must be a part of the groom's family because they knew he wasn't part of theirs, and they said, sure, you know, just hop in, you know, and um, um, they said that um, uh, that as they, when they got in the car um, uh, to, or in the van to um, uh, uh, to leave, they took a road that they ordinarily wouldn't take. And, they, you know, the, they didn't know why. Um, uh, they thought it was really strange that they, you know, that, but they, they, it was like a, a service road or something. And as they're driving along, they have a flat tire. So they, they pull off the road as much as they can, and they start to remove the tire. And uh, one of them removed the, they had to take all the, the tables and chairs out, put them on the side of the road so they could get to their tools and their spare tire. And, and one of them, as they had gotten the tire off, one of them said, there, there's a light up there. It's like the headlights of a car. It's approaching us fast. And... Um, they said that, you know, they, they got the loaded, they got the tire on, they got the chairs and table, tables loaded, and they jumped into the driver's seat and the passenger's seat, and they, they were ready to go, and the car wouldn't start. And it never occurred to them that their hitchhiker was gone, uh, and um, he said that uh, uh, they turned the key in the ignition, the ignition wouldn't start, and I said, well, what did you do? And he said, well, they opened the car door and tried to get out of the van, but suddenly everyone in the van was paralyzed. 
Wow. And then they saw the hitchhiker, and he had reappeared. But he was no longer dressed in jeans and a cow uh, and his cowboy hat. So he was wearing a one-piece suit. But on the top of his head, he had that cowboy hat. So he opened the door, and he climbed into the passenger seat. And he told us not to be afraid. And he closed the door, and he said, miraculously, this the car, the van, started moving towards this craft that had landed in the middle of the road. And I said, well, can you describe the craft? And he said, well, I never really saw it. The lights blinded us so much that we couldn't make out anything. And he said, they took the van and the four of us and the hitchhiker on board this, this spaceship. And he said, when we got on board the craft, the car, the vehicle doors opened and we were surrounded by four strangers. He said they were like humans, but they weren't humans. They had the strangest red eyes, he said, that I've ever seen. They pulled us out of the van and with one hand they lifted our feet off the ground and they carried us down a long highway, hallway. He said the eye, lights in the, in, the, in the craft hurt their eyes so much that they closed them to avoid the blinding pain. And I said, well, can you describe these strangers? And he said, the tall ones with the red eyes are very strong. They could lift us off the ground with one hand. But other than the red eyes, they said, they looked like humans. But they showed no expression. They never spoke to us. And, and Jose struggled against them, but it did no good, they said. And... Um, and then they said there was another group that had light-colored brown hair and big, round, bright blue eyes. Um, I said, well, did you see any other humans on board the craft? Because a lot of the stories I hear, there were other people on board the craft. And he said, after we were placed in the room, he said, uh, two others entered we had not seen before, along with our hitchhiker. And in a calm voice, uh, they assured us that they meant no harm. They said one of them they thought was a woman. And she took blood from them um, and said after a few minutes, uh, two other strangers came and led them down a hallway. They said it was morning when they woke up uh, and they saw a sliver of light on the horizon. And he said, I looked in the back seat and Jose and Miguel are there. But he didn't know who they were. He said, I lost my memory. I didn't even know who I was. I didn't know where I was, who I was, or where I was going. Wow. He said, I tried to wake Jose and Miguel, but they were unconscious. He said, Javier was lying outside the van on the ground. He said, I saw a car coming toward us, and I jumped out and flagged it down. And I told the driver, I didn't know who I was, and I needed help. And he drove away. That on my way back to the van, he picked up Javier and put him in the van, van behind the, the steering wheel, and I climbed in the passenger side. He said, I was afraid he was going to get hit by a car. And I said, well, how did you get home? And he said, well, a policeman came and took the four of us to the police station. They looked at our papers and discovered our names and addresses, and they took us home, and my mother put us to bed. They said it was several days before we remembered who we were. Said so Jose was the first to remember, and he said that we had been abducted by aliens. And gradually our memory returned. He said, my mother thinks we were captured by devil worshippers or demons. But he said, we know differently. We were on board a spacecraft, and we were led there by that hitchhiker. And I said, well, what happened to Miguel? And he said, well... At first, they didn't know, but we found out later that the police had taken him home to his wife. And they said they worried about it because his wife was abusive, and we worried she would kicked him out of the house. But they later they found out that that uh, he wasn't home. Uh, and uh, I said, "Well, what else can you remember uh, when you were on board?" The, I said, uh, "You know, spacecraft. You know, there has to be something." And Javier said, I remember a cold mist in the room. 
He said it felt like a solid rain. It smelled like rain, but I know it wasn't rain. I also remember that everything I touched was cold. It was so cold it burned. Um, the touch wasn't something he had he experienced before, he said. Um, Alicio said, um, I remember a humming sound, he said. It was high-pitched, a sound that I had never heard before. Um, these were three interesting, well, actually, they were all four. They were brothers and cousins. Um, but the one thing... Um, uh, That, that stood out of my mind is they were they were literally led to this UFO by by this hitchhiker. He took them on a road. Now they had a there was a factory on this road. It was a kind of a service road where a lot of the textile factories were in Mexico. And he said uh, when. When the tire blew, they were across the road from this huge textile factory. And his factory runs 24 hours a day, but there was not a light on. He said, generally, it looks like a city when you drive by there with all the lights that are on. But this particular night, there were no lights. The only lights they saw were those blinding lights from that UFO. And the alien chose them as the ones to take on board. Wow. They, don't re they didn't remember a lot of what happened to them on board the spacecraft. They lost consciousness. Now, what's interesting about their story about this mist is that I've had other people tell me that this mist is used, it's a, some kind of a chemical that is used to make people forget. It's a drug that they put into the atmosphere and as you breathe it you lose your consciousness and your awareness and the aliens have said that it doesn't work on all people but it works on most humans and that's what's important to them because if 100 percent of the humans came back and said this is what happened to me on board a spacecraft somebody might listen but if only you know, less than one percent come back and say, "I was this happened to me on board a spacecraft." Nobody listens. Everybody laughs at them and thinks they're nuts or they're just making up stories. So they said, "We don't worry if you go back and you tell the story that you were on board a spacecraft, because nobody's going to believe you anyway." And I thought that was rather an astute observation because that's exactly what's happened, isn't it? Oh yeah, definitely. I hear so many people on, you know, in different places who would never even have an opportunity to talk with one another. But, you know, their stories are so close in, in detail that it just, it, it's kind of common sense that it had to happen to them because, I mean, if one's telling a story on one side of the world and, th and another person is telling almost the same story of what they went through and they're on the other side of the world, you know, it's it just doesn't. It's common sense that they they couldn't get together to come up with the same kind of outcome. Well, and you know, the other thing that that you always hear, Sue, is a, uh, you know, well, people are just making up stories around this science fiction movie they saw or some other people's experiences, you know, that have been written about. But you know, the people I'm writing about are people that don't have access to all that media, so that makes you stop and think. I mean, here's a group of people who are telling the same story that is popular through media and books, but they don't have access to those things. And so there has to be a lot of truth to what we're hearing. Absolutely. I think it's fascinating. It's like cuddling up next to a campfire and just, you know, listening to you is amazing. You know, you just want to cuddle up with up to, next to a campfire and just listen. Well, thank you. You know, there's 46 stories in Sky People that I was told throughout, you know, uh, Central America. Um, 
uh, I, you know, when when I started this journey, I I uh, became so fascinated by the people, their culture, the stories they had to tell, and uh, you know, I just kept going back and going back, and and uh, it was important to me to to get to the truth, to uh, listen to the stories they had to tell. And I collected, all, uh, I think about 90, I think it was about 96, 90, 98 stories. And so actually half of them are, are included in the, in the book. That so. is just, that had to be a, such a fascinating, exciting time in your life to be able to do this stuff. Well, it was, you know, and, and I didn't have any restrictions on me. You know, when I, the first time I went to Mexico, um, uh, and I, I had this idea in the back of my mind, and I'd gone there with my husband and two friends. Um, um, I was still employed at MSU, and I was um, working with a, a group of um, Native American students uh, and a group of Native Hawaiian students, and we were looking at similarities and differences in cultures. And uh, so over Christmas break, we had gone down there, and we were looking at, you know, are there any direct connections anywhere? And um, and after I, I made that initial trip, I said, I have to do this. You know, this this is uh, this is what I meant to do. And of course, you know, I still was on faculty at MSU, so uh, when I retired, then it was a perfect time for me to continue my work. It's exciting to read stuff like this in books, but to sit here and actually be able to hear you, I mean, that's you saying the story, it's, it makes it so much more fascinating and it puts so much more excitement and, in, in, you know, just reality into it. It's amazing. Well, thank you. It was certainly a... Um a labor of love, uh, and and that uh, there were there were times that it was difficult, really difficult. Um, but other times, uh, you know, I mean, in terms of travel or uh, you know the the uh, roadblocks, um, you know, I, I would go in search of cities that uh, that uh, Stevens and Catherwood had visited and wrote about in their books, and I could, you know. I, was having the hardest time finding them. Um, you know, there are several hundred cities in in that part of the world that have never been excavated. Um, and and it's just an, you know, you go to a place like Palenque and you're just in awe of, of the temples that are there and, the, you know, the different buildings. And yet, you know, if you stop and think, you know, there are over a thousand buildings at Palenque that have never been uncovered, never been restored. I mean, some of these cities were huge and uh, housed as many as 100,000, 150,000 people. Uh, and what's so amazing about their architecture, too, is that many of these cities were painted red and they had the uh, uh, mica which is that fool's gold that glistens in the sun, mm -hmm. uh, was put into the red paint so that the, the cities, whenever you would come upon them or see them in the jungle, they're sparkling like gold. Just, it must have been an amazing sight. And you can still see traces of that red paint and that mica on a lot of the ancient buildings. These, when you went to, to um, talk to these people and get their stories, did they accept you right right away? Did they just accept you well, right away? I think the advantage I had, and I could never have done this without the drivers and guides that accompanied me. And because these guides and drivers, particularly the drivers, were so well known in those communities and were of indigenous descent themselves, I, uh, they provided me the the entry into the communities, and then I think the fact that that um, uh, you know I I uh, 
never made judgments. I, you know, if whatever was going on uh, in the villages where I went, if there was a celebration, I joined in. If, you know, I went to funerals. I, I, uh, um, I went to weddings. I went to to uh, uh, christenings. I, I uh, was. I, I, I really embedded myself into the communities. If dishes needed to be washed, I helped the women, you know, I helped them cook, I, you know, I, being among the Maya, for example, reminded me a lot of my upbringing, because I grew up without running water, I grew up where we had to carry water to, to wash, to, uh, to wash clothes, to, to drink, to bathe, uh, and heat it on a stove, and, and, uh, um, bathe out of a zinc tub. I mean, that's the way I grew up. Um, so being among the Maya was like be, uh, the way I grew up. Um, and so I, you know, I didn't look at this as being unfortunate uh, poverty. I looked at it as a way of life uh, because that was my way of life at one time. And so, I, you know, I fit in that way. Uh, I also made an effort not to stand out as a as a rich American. Um, I dressed simply. Uh, many times I dressed like the women of those villa- of those villages. Um, it was just um, basically immersing myself into their culture. Wow. I would think it would be fascinating to live that way. I think in today's world, there's too much technology. There's too much. I would like to live back on the prairie like they did in Little House on the Prairie. That's just my my personal <laughs> preference. Well, you know, it's a hard life. I don't want to glamorize it in any way. It is a hard life. But, you know, that's the way I grew up. Uh, we didn't know we were poor. Uh, we didn't know that we were disadvantaged and... Uh, Fortunately, uh, you know, there wasn't the welfare and the, um, you, you know, somebody said to me, well, how in the world did you go to college? I said, well, they didn't have Pell Grants and student loans back then. I worked 50 cents an hour in a switchboard and got scholarships, you know, because my family couldn't afford to send me to school. But I just that think was- it, it seems like it would be such a, you know, a more pure um, family dedicated time where people were more about each other. And these days it seems everybody's so into, you know, electronics and technology and everything else that we as families kind of forget to incorporate family time in time when you shut off the computers and you shut off the cell phones, you know, and you don't put your dishes in a dishwasher. You know, you actually put them in the sink and wash them. And that's the stuff that I would love to have that kind of, of connection, you know, that family connection where you're you're working together as a family to make sure that you're, you know, you have what you need. Well, you know, it, it's certainly um, uh, a difficult life. I remember, you know, growing up, there was a um, there was a wash day, for example, because it took the entire day to wash your clothes and hang them on the line because you had to carry the water, you had to heat the water. You had to wash the clothes, you know, and and you used to scrub board and boiling, uh, and then you had to wring them out and you had to hang them on the line, and hopefully they would get dry by the end of the day so that you could bring them in. You know, it was just that kind, and even if it rained, you, you it, Monday was wash day and you wash clothes, <laughs> and then it, you know it was, that's just the way it was, and then. Every day was set aside for some kind of major activity because, it, and it was repeated every week. And um, uh, I remember Saturday was the day you cleaned house, uh, and everything had to be cleaned, you know, and dusted and mopped and and uh, and so you know it was it it wasn't an easy life, you know, when you have to carry your water for everything and and uh, heat everything and and. Uh, but one of the things that, that you do learn is how to be strong and how to survive. Um, it's, it, it's, uh, and, and I think you see those qualities in the, 
in the Maya people, you know, they have a very simple life, but one of the things that they do have is love for one another. And the families are very close, and they love to celebrate um, birthdays, uh, holidays, and and uh, and that for me was uh, was very interesting. Uh, you know, I, I stayed in many of their homes and and uh, was welcomed, and and I, you know, I just uh, I think that, that that helped me a lot is the fact that I just kind of fit in, and then I didn't make judgments about them. Too often, I think researchers uh, they'll they'll go in to a village and they want to do research, but at night they want to be back in their four star hotel. Right. Um, and and for me, I I stay in the village and stay in somebody's home where somebody give me a bed, you know. And um, but I had a you know it was a wonderful journey. I mean, wonderful. I'm going back and. January. Oh, that's awesome. Because um, I just can't stay away. Well, hopefully you'll have more to talk to us about when you get back. I sure do hope so. My niece is going with me. And uh, this time I, I, uh, I've gotten to a point in my life where I'd like to have, a, you know, somebody with me when I travel now. So I have a, my grandfather's grandmother she was pure-blooded Indian, but I'm not exactly sure what uh, what tribe she was from. Um, when he was a child, his thyroid, I guess, died, and they told they told his parents to take him home and make him comfortable, and that he was going to die. Well, his grandmother asked if she could take him and heal him. Well, they, you know, they said yes, and. She took him home, and somehow she healed him, and he lived till he was like 70 years old. And I wish I knew more about her and more about her heritage. What well, do you know her name? I don't. I was I'm trying. I was trying to look back through like ancestry, you know, and find it. And I so wish I could, because I just I'd love to know more about her. And who, you know, what she... Now, if you could find her name, that would be a clue, you know, to help you. But so many of the of the records of, of uh, Native American people, you know, they, they don't go back that far because, uh, um, you know, they're, either their names were changed uh, and given more, you know, names were translated or uh, into English or, or names were um, just selected, you know, um, so it, it it's difficult to trace a lot of your Indian heritage because you'll get to a point where it just stops. That's kind of what happened and, uh, to me, yep. Yeah. But I would so love so, to know. But I think, you know, you you would be surprised. You, you know, you you take, for example, um, out here in, 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 the, uh, in this Northern Plains area, um... You don't have, uh, you know, the, there's only been contact uh, with, uh, with the white man, you know, for a couple hundred years. But if you go on the East Coast, the Indians that have lived on the East Coast are in contact with them over 500 years. And the Indians on the in East Coast have intermarried a lot more with... Um, the non-Indian than the Indians out here. So you have a, um, a, a, a real disparity here. You know, like, a, um, you know, you'll come across, like, um, the Navajo tribe, for example, I think about 75% of, of their people are still full bloods, and only 25% have intermarried. And it depends on tribe to tribe, you know, what you, what groups you have. And as more people intermarry, the less stronger the tribe becomes in terms of tradition and stories and of those things. Because uh, if it's marriage to a non non Indian, you know, uh, if it's a if the female is is white, generally the female is responsible for bringing up the children. Uh, and teaches the children, doesn't know a lot about Indian ways. 
On the other hand, if it's another travel group, you get mixed travel groups going about. So it's interesting what's happening uh, throughout the country because what happened on the East Coast is now starting to happen out here. I think I'm an old soul in a lot of ways because for to me that would be absolutely fascinating to be right there with them and, and get to sit around and listen to their stories and just, you are a lucky lady. Well, I consider myself to be lucky. I, you know, I'm, uh, uh, God has smiled upon me and I, I uh, am ever grateful. Well, we would love to have you back on when you come back from your journey. Well, I'd love journey. to come back, and any time that you you need somebody, uh, give me a heads up, and if I'm free, I'll be happy to come back and talk with you and, and share stories with your listeners. Well, I'd like to have you back after you get back from your next journey, because I'm excited okay, about well, what I'm, you're going to learn. Planning, uh, my niece and I, I think, will go in January. Um, either January or February. I like to go when it's cooler down there um, a lot. I, I, I love spending Christmas there. Um, that's one of my favorite times of the year. But, uh, and a lot of it has to do with it's cool. And then I love to see what they do with Christmas trees down there and, and the New Year's. Can you tell us a little bit about... El Viejo, which is... They, you, you, you go through these small villages and... and they take clothes and they build an old man, El Viejo is, you know, uh, and and they they uh, literally fill this old man up with, with uh, firecrackers. And they'll have him riding a bicycle. They'll have him sitting out front in lawn chairs. And you drive through these villages and you may see a dozen of these El Viejo, you know, out in front of different houses. And then... When New Year's comes on on the stroke of midnight, they they light El Viejo on fire, and so you have all these these firecrackers going off. It is quite a celebration, even in a, a village of fifty people, and it's quite a sight to see. So that is awesome. Uh, oh, it is. There's just so many customs and things that that go on in that part of the world that I really enjoy the holidays. Uh, um, south of the border. It's more dangerous, though. I have to admit, I have to be a lot more careful and a lot more thoughtful about what I do uh, and where I go. There's no question about that. That is fascinating. It has to be so exciting to have that kind of a life where you can just go and do the things you want to do. Well, you know, it's taken time because, like I said, I planned this when I was 15 years old and you know it took me a long time to get there but I'm I'm very grateful that I was able to to make the trip I was and, out you know sorry. I'd like to encourage your your um, your listeners to to go on to my website at uh, www.sixkiller.com I'm in the process of adding a lot number of things to my website I want to put up traditional star stories from the different tribes that I've been told. So I'm working on that. And because my book, uh, you know, you, you are limited. You know, your publisher says, I don't want a book that's more than 95,000 words. So, you know, you have to choose your stories and eliminate this and eliminate that. Um, I've included, um, uh, I'm going to include some different um uh, trips I took and things I was doing in that part of the world, just as a sidelight for people to read, um, uh, you know, things like, uh, they, they, they weren't really um, uh, the kind of stories that, I, that, uh, that people told me, but uh, I know that one of the trips that, that I took was in search of a, an alien baby, um, a translucent man from the stars and but but they weren't they were you know it was just an adventure I went on so I'm going to include some of my adventures uh, on that website and I'm working on that and also working on my third book um, this one will be about American Indian uh, stories but the, the uniqueness about this book will be that 
the stories come from uh, Native Americans who do not live on reservations. You know, um, 78% of American Indians do not live on Indian reservations. Wow. Um, and we are scattered all over the country. And um, um, many of my acquaintances or people I have met who are of Indian blood do not live on Indian reservations. And so I am telling their story in my third book. You know what I think would be fascinating would be to right. be able to get a CD or a DVD or even books on tape of you telling your stories because there's there's so much of a difference in reading them and actually listening to you. You have that gift um, when you tell your stories. You have that gift that the people listening are, you know, I, it's so, I can put myself right there when you're telling your stories. Well, you know, Sue, uh, I come from a line of storytellers, you know, that that's an art that is uh, encouraged and fostered in uh, among American Indian tribes uh, uh, from an early age, you know. Uh, uh, so, uh, so um, I'm I'm pleased to hear you say that because I think. Uh, uh, my grandma would be proud. <laughs> well, I would love to be able to sit down and, and put in like a CD or a DVD and just, I could listen to you all day. It's amazing. Well, thank you. And it sure has been a pleasure being here with you. It's been a pleasure having you on, and I want to thank you for taking the time to be with us. Well, you're certainly welcome, and let's keep in touch. And when I get back from, I'm just going to Mexico this time, but when I get back from Mexico, maybe we can talk, okay? Oh, absolutely. I would love that. Thank you. You're sure welcome, and you have a great week. Thank you. You too. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. All right. Well, that was an absolutely fascinating, and I do mean fascinating, uh, interview with her. She is an exceptional storyteller and she is just an amazing woman and I would really like to to encourage you guys to go on her website and get her books because they are fascinating as well um, her website as she said was www.sixkiller.com uh, and I really really think you guys should go out or go check her out and get her books well that's all we have time for today we post our shows on YouTube and if you want to know more about our guests and upcoming shows, visit our Info to Rail webpage. Just Google it. Just Google Info to Rail um, and click on our Google Sites page. And I want to thank you all so much for being with us here today at Info to Rail. And we hope to see you here each week. May God bless you and keep you. And may His face shine upon you in these uncertain times. We'll see you soon.